Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Let, let's do that. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for Amy this morning that you would just continue that work. You, you said that you are faithful to, to continue the work which you have begun in each of us. And so we ask that you do that right now for all of us. As we look to your word, equip us, Lord, with things from your scriptures that would cause us to grow. They'd be like miracle grow uh, poured on a plant, Lord, that would make it to just spurt, uh, a, a growth spurt would come about, Lord. We, we want to be like that before you, that you would just grow us up in the things of you and that you would use us, Lord, as you see fit. Fill us now with the things that you have for us this morning from your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Today I'm going to do something special. I'm going to go to the book of Psalms. You know, having had a week of vacation with my family, um, I'm so used to teaching multiple times a week Bible studies and always being in the Word to prepare for those studies that this week I got the week off. And uh, so I got to read what I call reading for me. Like just um, not because I had to teach a study, but just like, hey Lord, speak to me. Uh, encourage me from your word and so I did something I just departed from I didn't work on any studies I already know the next part in Romans chapter 2 it says I'm not ashamed of the gospel Paul says it's the power of God unto what unto salvation for those that believe so next week I'm going to do the Romans study when we're back uh, hopefully on the beach and uh, but today I want to do a psalm with you it's Psalm 19 this is a psalm that I spent most of my week just mulling over this psalm have you ever had a passage that just encourages you you know you read it and and you can reread it and reread it and every time you see something different from the very same passage that's how this psalm was for me this past week while we were while we were on vacation I just kept rereading this psalm I kept thinking you know this psalm has so many juicy parts in it you know that are really speak to my spirit and and they're ones that like they individually could be a study on their own but the whole of the psalm is not that long. It's only 14 verses. So I'm going to do read through the whole psalm for you right now and then break it down into, into a few of the parts that really minister to me. And hopefully some of those parts will minister to you. As you know, I found in the Lord, Paul the Apostle said, that which I receive from the Lord is that which I deliver to you. And so he, he just gives us a really good insight of how to share with people. Don't try to share stuff God didn't show you. Stick with what he's been speaking to you about. What's he been encouraging you in your faith? And because you might not realize it, but God's already in control and knows all of your appointments, knows everyone you're going to see. And you, you might see a verse and go, wow, that really speaks to me today. And I, I tell you, if that happens, just cling to that through the day because God will usually bring someone in your path who needs to hear just what you needed to hear. And all you have to do is say, here's what the Lord has, like Paul said, this is what I received from the Lord. So this is what I deliver to you. Just stick to doing that. When you share the Lord with people, stick to what He's showing you. And you'll see, they'll go, wow, how did you know that? And you're like, how did I know that? I don't, you know, I don't know nothing. I, I've been around long enough to know. Well, all I know is that the guy I serve knows everything. And I am convinced and have seen him do it repeatedly where... I just read in my devotions in the morning about a verse that spoke to my heart and it can happen not even minutes after I close my Bible when my devotion ends. I'll just be, thanks Lord for that time with you. Ring, the phone rings, someone calls, I got a question Pastor, does the Bible say anything about yada yada yada? And I'm like, yeah, um, it's in this place, in Psalm 19, I just read it. And they think, oh sure, you just read it, you know, you just know it. And they don't realize, I really just read it. And I, I, like, I just read that. Let me, and, and you can share with them. And God is faithful. He's always faithful. He's at work in all our lives. And you might be the one that will be getting the verse first, or you might be the one that gets to hear the verse that someone else just got. But either way, stick to what he's been showing you, and you'll see just beautiful fruit from this. So this psalm, I'm going to start with the last verse, because this is the verse that I knew the best from this, because I know it as a song. 
You know, we take a lot of the scriptures and put them to music. And as a worship leader, this is one that I've known. Verse 14 of Psalm 19 reads, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be, what? Acceptable in your sight, O, o, o Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, I, already, I hope you know that God is our rock. You know, we, we have a song we sing, Jesus is the rock that rolls my blues away. I mean, he's, he is that firm foundation. What Better than anything else, we have Jesus to, to be the rock. It's a, it testifies in the book of Hebrews that Christ was the rock that followed the Israelites around to the desert. Does anyone remember what the rock did for the Israelites in the desert? Because remember, it says everything happened to them happened to them for our example. Moses was instructed by the Lord to take his staff when the children of Israel were whining. Oh, you brought us in the desert to die, you know. God was bringing them out of Egypt to free them from bondage. But to them it felt like we're, we're dying here. We're, we're, you know, you're killing us. You brought us out in the wilderness to die. There's no water. So the Lord told Moses to take his staff and to smite the rock. Hit this rock that was following them. A rock was following them through the desert. And it's, this is a testimony, by the way. The Jews love studies like this. This is called types and shadows of the Messiah. And so Moses took the staff, he smote the rock, and what happened? It says water flowed forth. And, and when you've got a million people to give water to in the desert, we're not talking a little drinking fountain. You know, we're talking out comes this water flowing. And so in the book of Hebrews, we're told this was a testimony of Christ. Now, the second time they whined, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Go and speak to the rock, and it will bring forth water. But Moses got upset. I hope you didn't just teach us. Did you teach us last week? He's grinning at me. I didn't hear his study, what Aaron taught last week while I was gone, so I don't know. But, but when Moses, the second time, Moses was instructed to go and speak to the rock. The rock had, and if you know the story about Jesus, it says he was bruised for our iniquity. He was smitten, okay, on our behalf, for our for our uh, removal of our sin. So he took that, in Isaiah, he took that beating for us. But after the beating, it says now there's a different testimony, a type of, of Christ. It says Moses was just to speak to the rock. You don't have to smite it anymore. Well, it was already, he, he was bruised once, beaten once. He was, it was done. It was complete. Remember he said on the cross, the last words he said is, it is what? Finished. It's done. So, so that was done. So now all they needed to do was speak to the rock to receive the water. Just Moses speak. But Moses got impatient. Does anyone know what he did? He smote the rock. He smote the rock twice. He was ticked at the people. He went whack, whack. And the Lord says, why are you smiting the rock? I, uh, you're making it like I'm, I'm mad at the people. You're misrepresenting me, Moses. I'm not mad at the people. You're supposed to be my example to them. I want you to go and just speak to the rock. And Moses is going to get a quite a stinger for this misrepresent. You know, the Bible says, to Beware lest very many of you be teachers, because you incur a stricter judgment. You know, he's gonna, it's going to cost him, because he misrepresented. God's not mad at people. This is what some people... But if you listen to some preachers in America, you might think he is mad at them. You know, that he's, up, he's not uptight with them. You know, the Lord... The Lord went to great lengths to redeem us. And that's why it says, my rock, and what's the last line? My redeemer. Okay? My rock and my redeemer. He's the one who's there to be the rock that gives us the water we need, the living water of life. And, and he's the one who redeems us from our sin. Now here, he ends the psalm, and I say he, this is a psalm David wrote. This, this last verse is the part that spoke to me because we used to sing it. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Meditation is, what are you mulling over? What, what's really going through your heart? You know that, it, there's things that we, our heart feels and, and ponders and mulls over and, and, and those things what what our heart's affections are towards. He said, may the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let, 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 now how many of you, I don't know if you know this, but Psalm 5 starts off with, give ear to my words, O oh Lord. 
it, turn, turn to Psalm, just keep your finger here in Psalm 19. We're real close. It's only a couple pages away, I'm sure, for you, for you in your Bible. Psalm 5 says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. This is another Psalm of David. Consider my meditation or my groaning. Another translation says, yeah, Consider my groaning. None of us groan, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lord, consider my groaning. And he says, And hearken unto the, the voice of my cry, the King James says. Or, Hear the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for unto you do I pray. In the morning, he says, O Lord, you will hear my voice, and in the morning I will order my prayer to you, and I will eagerly watch. You know, when we start off the day, David says, as soon as you start off the day, Lord, consider what I'm, my meditation, what I'm, what, what I'm mulling over. Now, I don't know if you've thought about this, but to start off your day, what, sometimes when you wake up, your mind can be having pizza dreams, and <laughs> you can have some really weird thoughts, and, and it's a really good psalm to pray because... You're like, hey, Lord, consider my meditation, what I'm thinking about. And you're like, ooh, i got to change the, the channel, so to speak. You know, this is not exactly what I want to start off with the Lord. You know, and you might have some carnal thoughts or something when you're waking up. and Like, oh, Lord, who? Oh, excuse me, Lord, um, you, you know, consider my meditation. Then he says, I will cry to you. I'll cry to you, Lord. Whatever it is that you're, whatever distracts you, I want to encourage you to follow this pattern that David lays out in these psalms. Cry out to the Lord about it. Say, Lord, I got a problem down here. By the way, can you snow the Lord anyway? I mean, does he know that you're, what you're going through? He knows what you're going through, so just be honest. Lord, I have this problem, or I'm tempted in this area, or this is a struggle. I want to, you know, I've got to confess to you guys, when I first became a Christian, I came from some really hateful, hurtful things that had gone on in my life. My mom had been married and divorced five times. You know, the last guy, his, his son, my stepbrother, raped my sister. And, uh, and I was away at Bible school. By the time I got back, he was already out of the picture. My mom had divorced him. It was one of the fastest, shortest marriages she had. But, uh, but that one, I, I wrestled with. I wanted to kill. It, it's a Sicilian thing, maybe. But, you know, when somebody touches my sister, I just wanted to just, I mean, lose all my Christianity and go take care of this guy. And, and the Lord is like, I'm like, Lord, this is so hard. You know, G Jesus does things, so I just need you to help me. And there's nothing wrong with confessing to him and calling out to him. Whatever it is that's on your, the meditation of your heart, whatever's going through there, you can't snow him anyway. Go, oh, Lord, I just, God bless that stepbrother of mine, that ex-stepbrother of mine. You know, like, yeah, right. My idea of bless him is, Lord, save that jerk. And, uh, and forgive him because he needs it. That's as about spiritual as I could get. You know, he really needs your forgiveness. And, uh, and I hope someday you, you take him to task. You know, David, David would pray, Lord, you, you take the, my enemies and take care of them. But, you know, in God's economy, Saul was an enemy of the cross. And God took care of Saul big time. You know what he did? He took him from persecutor of the faith and made him a proclaimer of the faith. He goes, I'm going to fix you. You know, better than I would have ever thought of. I would have been like, kill that guy. That, that's the Sicilian side coming up. Like, Get rid of him. But God goes, no, i got a better idea. I'll save him, and I'll make him suffer for the gospel, and, but he'll be used. And Paul, the guy we call Paul the Apostle, used to be called Saul of Tarsus. And Saul was a bad, wicked dude that God said, let me put him on my team. But I got a little adjustment, attitude adjustment. I had to pack three days of blind in him, and, and showing him everything he would suffer for the gospel. And yet, did Saul quit? Did he ever turn away after that? No. He went on to serve the Lord, Paul, to great persecutions, great, great endangerment of his life. And I think, Lord, you're better than I am. Sometimes when I pray for my enemies, I'm praying, get them, and you're, but I'm not praying, get them like you want to get them. <laughs> you know, like, if, if I was praying like you, Lord, save them. Like, what if he had saved these guys, these ISIS guys that are so zealous for wrong? What if they got saved and were zealous for the right? I mean, if they can be that zealous. By the way, getting zealous guys, even if they're for the wrong, into God's kingdom is a good deal. Because sometimes Christians are really apathetic. They're lethargic. You get some guy who is zealous for wrong and, and show him the light, and when you do, snap. Everything changes. He starts to be an instrument God uses mightily. So I'm not 
I'm not worried about zealous guys for wrong. I'm like, bring it on. We just need to bring you into the light. And so here, this psalm, Psalm 19, gives me some insight into that. First, it's going to say something about the Lord. Look at verse 1. It says, The heavens are telling of the glory of the Lord, and their expanse is declaring the works of His hands. If you look on the front of your bulletin, um, uh, or I'm sorry, on one of the verses on the inside, we used to have this as the opening verse on our bulletin, the, um, this verse right here. It's not on there anymore. We put the grace, grace one from Ephesians. But this used to be on the front of our bulletin, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens are telling of the glory of the Lord. And their expanse is declaring. You just look out at everything that he's made. And he says, it's just telling people that he's there. This didn't just miraculously by, you know, big bang, poof, it came into, with no, with no outside greater force did it come into this great organized, beautiful thing that we look out and see. I mean, the Lord has... He's, he's made His handiwork known in all of the creation. Now it says, Day to day pours forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge, and there's no speech, nor are there words. There's, their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them He has placed a tent for the sun, which as a bridegroom coming out of His chamber, it says, it rejoices as a strong man, and it runs His course. It's from its rising from one end of the heavens to in its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. It's interesting because in the Psalms it says this word in Hebrew, the circuit, is um, um, like an elliptical cir- c- c- circle that's used here. And, and when guys used to teach years, you know, millennia ago, the earth was flat, they wouldn't overlook the things in the Bible that said that the sun does this thing like a strong man, rises on this side, makes its circuit, comes back around. And, and then it talks about the surface of the earth inscribed as a circle that the Lord formed in the middle, out of nothing. Just inscribed the circle and went, that's the earth right there. Just formed it. Just by speaking, by His power. Now the word of His testimony is see. He's saying it's being spoken from everywhere in creation. And next week when we look at Romans 2, we'll see. God has made it where no man has an excuse. He can't say, I don't think that there was any testimony that there was a God. He said, you just got to look around. Just the, gre- the, the awesomeness of creation testifies of what an awesome creator there is. I know I've used this example before, but how many of you have gone to a really fancy hotel or or a, a rich person's house where they have an infinity pool. You know what infinity pool is where they, they make one edge perfectly level and they flood it a little bit too much so that it flows over the edge of a lip and it goes into like a little waterfall cascading. And if you're on the side where you sit and you look over the top of that edge and they have the ocean in the background, it, they call it infinity because it's an optical illusion. The, the edge of the water blends right out into the horizon so it makes your pool look like it goes on right on out into the horizon line well to do that as a a, my grandfather is a master mason from Italy to do that particular thing is a is a masonry achievement because the lip of the pool I don't know if you know this but it has to be so accurately level otherwise the water if it what if what what if it has a dip do you know what will happen just a, a quarter of an inch off say on anywhere along the line and all the water will go to that spot and, and not be flowing off the rest of it. You have, to, you have to get this edge just perfect. And it has to be bullnose just right, curved on the, on the outer edge so the water clings to it. Like it, it has this capillary action that it just clings over and drops so that it doesn't... It's got to be a smooth sheet. Well, to do that takes great skill. And if... Any of you ever went to a pool and said to me, you know, wow, look at that infinity pool, perfect edge, goes all the way out to the, look, it goes into the ocean, the horizon, like, isn't that just amazing how that just, just randomly showed up out of nowhere, just, um, it's, you know, poof, it just happened to a, 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 I'd be looking at you like, are you crazy? (laughs) You know, that, that took design, someone had to design it, someone else had to execute the design with great great precision just to pull off that one little illusion of, of that infinity pool 
If I said to you, that's just amazing how that just happenstance came to be. You would look at me like I'm crazy. But when I say to people, look how awesome creation is. That it's just marvelous all in all its intricacies. Certain birds have to be with certain little bugs to eat. And, and they don't appear anywhere else except in this one, you know, ecosystem. Or this certain butterfly that we have here, this... This um, what's so called out for the? Yeah, the Kamehameha butterfly only occurs in certain areas where there's a certain flower that we have here in 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 the islands. And people go, oh, it just randomly happened. I'm, I, I'm telling you, you cannot have that by random. God designed it, and he he left his fingerprints all. It's like that mason. He left his fingerprints that he had been there, just by his work. His work tells you. My grandfather used to tell me, never boast about your work. Let your work speak for itself. You know, the, the master masons from Italy, they don't ever, they don't brag about how great they are. Their, their view is, in a thousand years, you'll know how great I am. Because they don't design anything to, to last for, like, the American builders, you know. Well, this is, a, we just slap it up. Who cares if it falls down in five, ten years? We don't care. We'll just rebuild it. No, these guys are like, we built this to be here for millennia, you know, thousands of years. There's stuff you can go to Italy today that was, that was put in place thousands of years ago by Masons. It's still there. Beautiful works of mosaics and stuff. Their thing was, look, we're going to build this to life. And how do you know how good we are? Just look at our work. The work testifies. Well, if man's work can testify about how great he is at doing his job, why can't God's work? testify how great a job he does. I mean, it does testify, by the way, but some people, they go like this. Wow, magic, that pool just appeared. Wow, magic, those trees and those butterflies that only exist here and those birds that only exist there, or this animal that only lives in this one ecosystem, just coincidentally. I said, no. It's all part of his handiwork, just like the sun put in its circuit to make its path. God said, I put it there to be a testimony, my handiwork. Now, David recognized God's handiwork. Is it good to recognize God's handiwork? How does it affect your day? When, when you recognize, you know, Jesus said, consider the sparrow. Little bird. This is not marvelous. He said, yet your heavenly Father feeds it. It does not sow, it doesn't reap, doesn't, you know, store up in barns, but every day your heavenly Father feeds it. And he says, how much more value are you than the birds? You know, sometimes just considering what God has made keeps the perspective of if he takes care of even the littlest bird, not one falls to the ground, says, without his concern. He knows every single critter, every, every little critter on this earth, he knows, and he says, and you're more valuable than that. So just looking around gives me a great perspective. Now this is the part that I had the most fun with this week. Coming up, verse 8. The law of the Lord, it says, is perfect. It restores the what? The soul. Anyone ever felt like your soul just felt dried up? Are you having a rough patch? You know, like, you, you, I hear this often as a pastor. I pastor my faith. I'm, I'm kind of in a dry spot. You know, not, not really having a real, that real full, full, living water springing out thing. It ain't happening. I'm like parched desert in my walk. I said, well, you know, the law of the Lord, it says, is perfect. Now, in, the, in the, some Christian circles, they teach that you must follow the whole Old Testament law. The, the whole Levitical, you know, all the 613 Levitical statues from the book of Leviticus, the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. They, they, they say, we, we did not, Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. So, therefore, we must live under the law. I don't believe that. The Bible also goes on to teach that we are no longer under the law, but under grace. And in grace, we're taught a new law. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, This is my commandment, that you do one thing. What is it that you do? Love, love one, another. one another. You know, that's what he says to do. That's fulfilling the law. Love one another. Now, that law of the Lord is perfect. If you love one another... The Bible says, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, 
and you love your neighbor as yourself, you'll complete the whole law. Don't make it more difficult. Just follow the, the things what Jesus taught. He put everything, I like it, into perspective. But the law of the Lord is perfect. You know, some of the things in the law, like um, Daniel, when we were on the cruise ship, he pointed out, yeah, Dad, I've heard you say, um, if we were good Jews, we would take every week, one day a week to Sabbath, to rest. And then if you follow all the holy days, you know, the, the Feast of Booths and the Feast of Weeks and, 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 and the Tabernacle, all the, um, the Passover time. If you did all of the Jewish holidays, and, and they, by the way, were they allowed to work on these holidays? I mean, any work? If you don't know their culture, we're talking no work. In Israel, they go to stay in hotels. And they program the elevator to go up and down to the first, third, fifth, Seventh, you know, all the the odd numbered floors, and the Jews, by the way, when when the hotel is being booked, they ask, you know, if they ask in Hebrew, they know they're Jewish, they're coming for the Sabbath to rest. They put them on the first, third, fifth. If the hotel gets too booked, they'll put them on an even number floor. But the, what the Jews will do is they won't even touch the button because that's work. When they get in the elevator, the elevator on the Sabbath. This program drove us crazy because, you know, coming from the America, we're like, you know, they put us on, you know, level 12. We got to ride 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. And then, and then we jump off at 11 and run upstairs. We get scolded. You don't do that. See, if you're good, you walking upstairs is work. So you got to ride to the 13th floor and then walk downstairs one floor because going downstairs is easier than going upstairs. No, it's less work. So this is what they do. They have resting down to an art. I'm telling you, when it says do no work, they're like, we don't even push the button. And we just rest. But how many days a year, Daniel pointed, he goes, Dad, I heard you teach this. We, we, a good Jew gets a, a, over a third of the year completely off. If you add up all the Sabbaths and all the holy, Sab holy holidays, you have a third of the year you do not work. Now i got a question for you. Do, are we under the law? Do we have to do all those days of Sabbath? No. But is it good for us to Sabbath? Is it good for us to get a rest? I mean, our culture is the worst. We have so many diseases, so many troubles with people with high blood pressure. They're angst out. They've been working. So I met one fellow. He'd, he'd been working like four months straight. On the cruise ship we were on, I was sad. Those people work without a day off. They go for six months at a time. Now they're like, yeah, but I get six weeks of holiday between my next, you know. Sh I don't know how to tell them. They look a little bit zombie-ish. No, this is like your waiter. I am your waiter. I've been doing this so long. I just hate my life, you know. And, and the life gets sucked out of them. And some of you know, huh? have any of you worked more than a week or two in a row and just pushed and pushed and pretty soon, what happens, I don't know about you, but what usually happens to me is I wind up paying at the end. I've, I wind up falling down and getting sick because I pushed too hard, too long, and then whether I like it or not, I wind up paying the Sabbaths back only in bed. <laughs> and they're not fun Sabbaths. It's not like what, what I'm talking about what the Jews would do, where they just take, they have resting down to an art form. I do believe that the law of the Lord is perfect. And if I would just apply the principle of resting, you know, in the principle of the law, it says that God will supply all your needs for seven days in six days. He doesn't need you to work seven days to take care of you for seven. He says, you work for six and I'll cover you. On the seventh day, you're covered. In fact, the, remember the whole story of the manna? Did you just go over that? Yeah, how he, how he supplies on that Preparation day, the day before the Sabbath, you can gather twice as much and it won't go bad. But the rest of the week, if you gather twice as much, what happened? It would spoil. So he's teaching them, every day I got you covered. And I even have you covered for a day of rest because he rested. On the sixth day, he said, when he was done, it's finished. And it says on the seventh day, he rested. Now if God took a day to rest, I need to learn. <laughs> You know, if God needs a day of rest, then I need a re day of rest, right? I mean, sometimes we think we're bigger than God. I'm better. I can do, I can, watch me, man. I'll work four months straight. Yeah, good luck with that. You're going to waste that first 
you know, however many weeks you get a vacation in bed, reco recovering. And it's not really restful like the rest where you just get to rest that God will... And are the Jews poor because they take a third of their year off? Have anyone noticed how, how they do financially? Do they do poorly? No. No. But the rest of the time they work so very, very hard. But they're refreshed when they work. Their work is more effective. You know, they, they start... We, our, our, um, my, one of my degrees is in business, and, and we actually study different things in business to see the most efficient models for getting the most production from workers. And they're starting to recognize that giving workers a break in the day, a mid-morning break in, in production line work of half an hour, just to say, take a break, have a little snack, that they get more done in the hour and a half before, from, the, from 10 to 10.30 they give a break. Then from 10.30 till noon they work before their lunch hour. In that one and a half hours, if they got the break, they do more work, than if they push them through from 8 in the morning till noon. They lose production because of pushing too hard. So we kind of need a break. You know, we God knew this about our frame. He's not stupid. He knows our frame. Says he is mindful we are but dust. So he knows how much our dust can take. And his law is perfect. It restores the what? Now this is the part he kept drilling me with. It restores the soul. Man, I, I just... Went, Lord, you're so cool. Now, the testimony of the Lord is in the same verse. His testimony uh, is sure. And it makes wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord, it says, are right. They rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. and It enlightens the eyes. And the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, and they're righteous altogether. Now, they are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter, it says, than honey and the drippings of honeycomb. And moreover, it says, by them, by the judgments of the Lord, it says, your servant is warned. In keeping them, it says, there is great reward. If we keep God's judgments, how would he judge something? Whatever he says to do, how he would handle it, that's his judgment. If we live according to his judgments, it says, it's more desirable than gold. Is it valuable to, to live following the Lord's ways? You know, does it pay? He says it's more valuable than fine gold. And it's sweeter than honey. Than the drippings of honeycomb. And if you've ever eaten honey out of honeycomb, I don't know what to tell you. That's the sweet. Isn't that the sweetest? Has any of you eaten, like, ripped out a piece of honeycomb? and just it, It's better than the stuff you squeeze out of the bottle. I know it's, they say the same, but that's not true. I think they add water and, and glycerin and junk to it. You know, you read the side of the bottle, you're like, this ain't even pure honey. You have to go to someone who has a honey farm to get real honey. But if you can get the real honey with the honeycomb chunks in it, and you grab out one of those chunks, and you eat that, it's sweet. Now he says, the judgments of the Lord are like that. David says, you know, when you just go with how God would judge the thing, you do how he, what he would call it. It says it's sweeter than, than that honeycomb. It's more valuable than fine gold. And fine gold's gotten pretty valuable. You know, I think, wow, David, you says, moreover, by your judgments, he says, your servant is warned. And in keeping them, this one really stuck out to me. How much reward is there? He says there's a great reward. Anyone want great reward for your week from the Lord? I mean... Him to reward. I know when he rewards, it's in ways we don't. He, it's like he gave us the great room steward on the trip. That was just a wink from the Lord. I got you. And by the way, she's going to be Filipino, so you better say good morning. You know, in, in Tagalog. And I'm like, uh, uh, remind me, Lord. Magandang umaga. Yeah. Magandang tanghali. That's good afternoon. Magandang gabi. You know, good evening. I Somehow the Lord just made, bing, popped it back in my memory. This is from five years ago I learned that. And just that little bit, how to say thank you. I try to teach my kids, learn to say thank you to someone in their language. You know, what's it hurt to learn to say thank you in another language? I mean, really. How many can say thank you in Spanish? Gracias, right? In Italian, it's grazie. So I grew up speaking Italian. It's really easy. You know, how do you say, you know, thank you in, in Tagalog? It's salamat. And if you're a kid, to show respect, you say salamat po to an adult. They have a very respectful way of saying 
and so I taught my kids say this to the to the people when you know you meet the one from from the islands learn just a little uh, in Thai kakum kap you know or for your girls kakum ka you just learn to say thank you there's nothing wrong with with learning that because it can how, how do you guys feel when you have someone who's a thankful person around you you know they just give just to, they say thank you instead of being like oh you owed me or you know yeah man just it's such a nice, it's such a nice thing, but our culture's losing that. And so I want to teach my kids, you be thankful, and you learn how to say thank you in their language. And, and there's nothing wrong with, there's, there's some things that the Lord will do for your life you don't even understand. These simple things of, of well, we did, last night we studied from the book of Ephesians chapter 5, about how Paul says to, to always give thanks. Have an attitude. I tell the kids, attitude of what? Gratitude. gratitude, that they would learn to be thankful, and it's a sweet thing in a youth to have that. There's only two verses left. It says in verse 12, "Who can discern his errors? Who? Which one of us can discern our own faults? You know, sometimes someone else has to point them out to us because we don't see them." He says, "And who can who can acquit me of my hidden faults?" David says. Also, he says, "Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins." He says, and let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I will be acquitted of great transgressions. Lord, David knew, David was never snowing the Lord. Lord, just cover my back, man. I got my own presumptuous sins and my, my own hidden faults I don't even see. I was telling Jan this morning, you know, I kind of wish I could start off the pastorate over and, and start with a better disclaimer. Like, <laughs> Like, you know, I didn't know to do this when I was young in the Lord. I'd be like, I would have started off saying, guys, I just want you to know your pastor comes with faults. He's not perfect. He's just a man trying my best. But if you see one of my faults, don't leave the church just because I have a fault, you know, because I'm pretty sure we all got them. But, but people put pastors on pedestals. And some of them show up thinking, oh, the guy, he, he somehow got the title because he had no faults. How about Paul that we just talked about, who was Saul? Did he get into the ministry because he had no faults? He's only killing Christians, beating them, scourging them, imprisoning them. I say he had a lot of faults. And God went, I'll use him. So if God would use him, we just need to remember that the Lord wants us to remember, hey, you know, disclaimer. I have hit, uh, and I might have faults, like David said, that, that are hidden. You know, who can discern sometimes I realize man I have so much more to grow every time I read this word I'm like oh there's another area I gotta work on you know if, if I'm gonna have my soul restored then I just gotta remember following his ways his law is perfect the law of the Lord is perfect restores my soul I'm not trying to get rid of it I'm trying to learn those things from his word that that restore my soul because it can, it can get easy to get burnt out in this life. Stuff can burn you out and you just be like, I'm over it. And there's a lot of Christians, by the way, suffering burnout. Especially ministers in our culture. Because they get told, oh, well, you're, you're, you're on call. You're 24-7. You're expected to be there. And, and it's almost like if you take a day of vacation, they go, oh, you're a terrible minister. <laughs> I, I got to confess to you, I think I'm a terrible minister because I hadn't taken a day of vacation. For five years, I didn't take vacation, and I think it just burnt me out. This last week was really good for my soul to not have to sit and prepare studies and just read the Word and let God speak to me and restore my soul. You know, it's, it's refreshing, and it's something that, that I'm going to try to do better, you know. Like I, I got to like start like adopting it, you know, and leave room for other men. Like Aaron, and, and we have Dave and Tori, Dave uh, that does the Gideons, so that he'd be willing to fill in. We just gotta throw that, throw that guy up front and let him share, you know. He's got a gift to teach. And uh, he might share something I would never, you know, have seen in the Word yet. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? When, how God shows different things to different people and, and, and how He uses us together. I know He uses Jeff Barnabas here as, a, as, a, as an encourager to people and a prayer warrior. And, and Herbert, our brother that does the chaplain work, what a prayer warrior that guy is. I mean, people say they want me to pray. I'm like, go see Herb, man. You want answers. Get, 
at these two guys. I mean, God doesn't just use one guy. It's not a one-man show. And that's what the, uh, he's been encouraging me in that. So I'm really excited to see what is he going to do. And I'm excited, I hope, to take my wife on a vacation for our 30th anniversary in September. And we went on the cruise, the lady was like, you're getting more points, you know, you can get a better room, cheaper now. You know, they give you, like, they want you to come back. So they're, like, trying to, to you know, kind of get soften you up. And, and do you want to book another cruise? Uh, well, I wish, you know. <laughs> but I'm going to ask the Lord to take care of what, what, He knows what we need to restore our soul. And so I pray that if you need something to restore your soul, you just, just follow what His law speaks to you. If he's telling you love that person, you're going, I hate him. <laughs> Your soul will not be restored. Okay? But if you will follow his, it's his law is perfect. If you will follow what he says, love your neighbor as yourself, then I'm telling you, it will do a work inside you that will restore your soul. And I think we got a lot of soul restoring meaning in, in, in the Christian faith right now. Just a, I feel like that's like a prophetic word to the body. But we need that. And it's just by following his command. What did he tell us to do? Love one another. Do it. Not He didn't make it difficult, but we have to do it. And when you wake up, the last verse, well, can you say to the Lord, consider my meditation, the meditation of my heart, O Lord? You know, when I wake in the morning, Lord, um, you know, may my meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. That verse, by the way, has helped me so many times readjust my thinking when I wake up. Right when I wake up, oh, my meditations weren't on the right thing. Lord, help me switch it to the right track. And you know, by doing that, it's helped my mind to start the day off right. So I'm going to give that to you to end with. That Maybe, you know, when you wake up in the morning tomorrow, you say, consider my meditation, Lord. Am I thinking on the right way? Am I? And if, if you're not, he'll you. You know, he's a great fine-tuner, isn't he? He can, he can adjust the channel, so to speak, and put us on the right frequency, put us on the right path. So, so let him do that for you. And I pray this psalm, you know, just if you've never read this one, hopefully some of these verses will be a treasure for your faith that you can cling on to. Highlight them and, and, and just go back to them for, for encouragement for your spirit. I believe, you know, his word is living. Active, it says, sharper than a two-edged sword. And so it's there to do its job. And, and it's just, all we have to do is just get into it. So may you be blessed this week. Let's pray and, uh, and send you on your way in, in the peace of the Lord. So, uh, and, and we're going to have a special time to look at the videos that Dylan's been doing. We looked at them before, but for those of you who didn't get to see them, we'll put it up on the big screen where you can see them. He made some awesome videos of the kids behind the scenes. And you can share them with your friends on the mainland that might not know about them. Um, you know, the, the, the stuff the kids are doing to reach the kids. And uh, I, I said, show me some of you guys that film all this stuff behind the scenes. So he made a series called All Creation Testifies of the Glory of the Lord. And it's just beautiful, some of the shots they got with the drone and the, and the GoPro out in the waves. And I love that one where he goes filming the kid on the wave and then <laughs> it, the kid tumbles and then it's behind the wave. You see his little fins going underwater. <laughs> He's... And he's being washing machine, I call it, as he goes tumbling out. But it's the coolest shot. I mean, the water's so clear. And you might want to share that with your friends. And, and that might get them listening to the other words of encouragement about what, I, what about when I'm depressed or I feel suicidal. or Those ones are getting lots and lots of watches on YouTube now. You know, I just saw the loneliness one has uh, 862 watches today. And uh, I'm just like, praise the Lord. There's a lot of folks feeling lonely. So if you know someone... I'll show you that link, and you can you can um, just point them to it. It just gives them a quick, it's a little devotional. It's like three to four minute long thing about, you know, from the scripture, something to help them when they're feeling like that. So you might have friends. These This next generation, they're all like this. They're totally, you know, you send me the link, you know, and they'll watch it. So I want to ask you guys to help me just by clicking on our, our website, AmazingGraceKona.com. The link is right there. Follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. And you just click it. It takes you straight over. And it's on the back of your bulletin. You don't have to remember. It's, um, you know, we have the domain names, Amazing Grace Ministries International.com, AmazingGraceKona.com. And you just click them. Take you right to it. And, and let the, and share it with your friends. And some of you want to share this stuff 
to show your friends back on the main. I know some of you are just showing off, but you want to say, hey, look at this. You know, this I went surfing at that beach, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, or I'm going to go down there and see that new green sand beach they went to. And, and there's a beautiful, some beautiful shots from South Point they got. So, so just share that with your friends and family and say, you know, it might, it might like, entice them to come out and come check out Church on the Beach. You know, we want to we dr- help draw people to the Lord. And so he's made us in a, you guys, we're, we're spoiled. Look around. It's supposed to be a hurricane, but thankfully we got beautiful skies, lots of clouds, a little bit of rain. And Jan's like, go, go. But there's a breeze. So, Lord, we thank you for the breeze. We thank you for putting that sun in its circuit, testifying that you have set all this stuff in, in order. And we acknowledge you, Lord, as we go on from this day. We just pray you be with us, watch over us, guard us, Lord, and help us to grow in these things of your word. Let them restore our soul. In Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. And the guy starts mowing the yard just to... Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.